Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Lindsay Elmore Show. First up, I will be talking with Dr. Chrisanne Gordon, who is a researching physician who studies traumatic brain injuries and then experienced a traumatic brain injury of her own. After that, we'll hear from my friend Jason Sapp, who, while he was in service in the military, underwent 11 minutes of active fire and suffered from some post-traumatic stress because of it. He reads a letter that he wrote to his wife. Their story is extraordinary. Tune in to the very end to hear from Dr. Gordon and Jason. Let's get to the show. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. As both a physician and a traumatic brain injury survivor, Dr. Chris Ann Gordon is uniquely qualified to talk about today's topic. Her resume almost appears to be a preparation for traumatic brain injury. She trained in science, in internal medicine, in the treatment of trauma, and was already widely published in these fields. She is a board-certified rehabilitation medicine specialist and holds appointments at The Ohio State University, which is where she received her Doctor of Medicine, as well as Riverside Methodist Hospital and Memorial Hospital of Union County in Marysville, Ohio. Back in 1996, she suffered a traumatic brain injury herself and spent two years calling on all of the resources that she had, mental resources, physical, financial, and spiritual, to help her work through her own recovery and find a new normalcy after years of feeling like she was out of her brain. She explored creative writing and creating films as a part of her recovery and gradually returned to the practice of medicine. She returned with a new expertise and an empathy being able to see traumatic brain injury from a patient's perspectives. Her struggles came back to her though. When she volunteered to perform traumatic brain injury evaluations at her local Veterans Administration Hospital, she was appalled by the fact that there were so many young men and young women who were over-medicated and often dismissed and just told, you're okay, don't even worry about it. To increase awareness of the plight of the veteran with traumatic brain injury, she filmed the documentary Operation Resurrection. She then founded the Resurrecting Lives Foundation and advocates for the proper diagnosis and treatment of traumatic brain injuries, especially among veterans returning from military combat zones. She ensures that the veteran is given access to good employment opportunities, which she considers to be key for rehabilitation and successful re-entry into the civilian world. Dr. Gordon, thank you so much for being on the Lindsay Elmore Show. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for what you are doing to make this nation calmer, more hopeful, uh, and, and everybody working together. Really, really appreciate being here. Well, that is such a kind thing for you to say. And and like, like you know, we're in such a moment where people need hope and people need to know that wonderful things are coming in the future for them. And you are a physician as well as a traumatic brain injury survivor. And I think a lot of people who face traumatic brain injuries, either themselves or in their family feel just a total lack 
of hope. So I hope just in our in our conversation today that we can we can reinvigorate and let people know that there is life no matter what afflictions face us. Exactly, exactly. So take us back to the very beginning. What happened? Because you were a physician, you were well-renowned and very well-researched in traumatic brain injury. And then in 1996, you had your own. What happened? That was was very interesting. And it was a stupid maneuver. I am a klutz, I will say that. And uh, I was actually putting away some Christmas decorations by pushing some very heavy china underneath the crawl space. And what I forgot was all of the physics that we had to learn, you know, when we were going to school, both of us. Um, And when I went from the shag carpet onto the cement, the whole box gave way and I literally went head on into a brick wall. I mean, the, the irony of the universe, you know, running into a brick wall, you know, head first. And I knew it was different than any other time I'd hit my head. And I knew I was going down and, oh. and I did. And I kind of came out of it uh, what we can determine now about 25 to 30 minutes later. So it was just that quick. I mean, though, in a split instance, I went from being who I was to this injury, to the fact that I never became that exact same person again, you know, which is not really a bad thing, according to my friends, but (laughs) definitely a a different thing. And I just want everybody out there who's listening because mild traumatic brain injury, which we're still kind of called 20 minutes or so of being out as a mild traumatic brain injury, nothing mild about it. And you don't have to be knocked out. You can be just dazed. You can, you know, just kind of stop for a moment. But all of that can have some consequences down the line. So I think that a lot of people think that traumatic brain injury is like this huge thing. Like you have to be an NFL player to experience traumatic brain injury. And here you are putting away Christmas decorations and you ignore the laws of inertia. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And you slam yourself into a brick wall. What are some other more subtle ways that people experience traumatic brain injury on a daily basis? Well, you know, falls is the number one. I I say that, you know, we should really consider ladder stoops, anything. Oh, my favorite, the chair, you know, the convenient chair that you pull up just to reach for that article that's in the cupboard right above you. You know, the falls are the number one reason for that. Then there's a lot of, you know, the weekend warrior, the person who goes and decides they're going to play, you know, tag football or tackle football in the neighborhood, Um, women in soccer, I mean, young soccer ladies with the headers, because that's a a big thing in soccer. So I think sports and falls would be the the main things there. But even hitting your head on a cupboard, you know, even like opening a door into your head, all of those are possibilities. And they happen all the time. So how can people recognize, you know, I remember, I remember back years ago, my cousin had about a one and a half year old and she's just flitting around the kitchen and this and that. And she just opens the refrigerator and boom, slams it into the toddler's head. So at different ages, you know, you would think that falls are either a problem with elderly people who are losing their ability to gait or idiot kids who are standing on rolly chairs and and things that they shouldn't be. But what do you look out for at different ages? You know, the mom who's got a toddler versus a teenager who does that flag football versus as our parents get older, what can we look out for in them? Right. It's very different. And that's a very good point that you brought. And, and after I answer your question, I'm going back to something else about that. Okay. So luckily, you know, kids are built with very resilient brains, you know, with a, a lot of ability to recover. I would imagine that the toddler did pretty well. I Just mean, fine. Just right. Fine. I mean, they do very well, though. You still have to keep looking at if they are like really sleepy all of a sudden. And, and you know, toddlers go from, you know, 90 miles an hour to zero miles an hour, but you can't wake them up easily. Or if they're very, very cranky, those are the things that you kind of look for them. Definitely if they get a big goose egg or if there's any laceration or something that tells you that there's an issue. So they're a little bit different class on um, The elderly, they're a totally different class. And the ones that the smaller the injury, the more it can mean for them because they most generally get bleeds into their heads. And many of the time the bleed is either immediate, in which case you know within a couple hours and you take them to the ER, 
most likely it is a couple days later, which leads to the delay of getting the which leads unfortunately to the increased amount of deaths in the elderly who have a traumatic brain injury. But now let's go to the teenager. Let's go to the group that I work with, our young veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan who have brains that are not yet mature and not still children. And those are the most vulnerable. So when we talk about those that are playing sports from middle school until about the mid twenties, the brain is reformulating, it restructuring itself, putting in new chemicals, putting in new pathways for like that entire decade. And anything you do to interrupt that, multiple you know, sports injuries, because as they say, the best predictor for a traumatic brain injury is a previous traumatic brain injury. And particularly very close, you know, one right after the other. Um, one within two weeks of another can be very, very difficult in this age group. And actually, we have a whole syndrome called second impact syndrome that can lead to death, which is why we take young men and women out of sports if they have a concussion in that teenage college years. Interestingly enough, when I got involved with our soldiers and Marines and our military that were, you know, in the Mideast fighting force or even in combat training, um, I realized that the DOD, the Department of Defense and the VA were not as familiar with that. It had been a long time since we had been in conflict. And the types of conflict that we had in Vietnam were not the blast injuries, were not rockets being hit, you know. There was mortar and there were hand grenades that caused traumatic brain injuries in the Vietnam era, don't get me wrong, but in our era, in this Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts, it was really horrific. We now have about 450,000 veterans from those conflicts who are struggling every day with a traumatic brain injury, and they look perfect. They look fine. You know, that's why they call it the invisible wound. Everybody seems to think, oh, you know, they were in the military, they're doing great. You know, not necessarily. And because they were in that younger group, um, the actual long-term effects on their brain can be so much more serious. I love what you said about the brain is not fully matured, yeah. but yet it is still not a child. And that is where the risk comes in. And I, I pull some statistics preparing to discuss with this, this issue with you today. And it's been estimated that up to 25% of the 3.2 million returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan have some sort of traumatic brain injury and more than 30% have post-traumatic stress disorder or as I'm now hearing it called post-traumatic stress injury that this is not a disorder this is an acute injury so talk to us about the difference between traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress injury and what's the difference between a disorder and an injury Okay, and first of all, I have to tell you that is brilliant. And thank you so much for bringing this up because um, actually yesterday was the eighth birthday of our Resurrecting Lives Foundation for our veterans. Congratulations. Yes, thank you so much. And what I was saying is for 10 years, I've been saying this is not a disorder. You know, what we have proven, and we're very lucky to be in the decade of the brain. Okay, so we're able to look inside the brain now. We're able to get special testing and look. And what we have discussed is this. First of all, the traumatic brain injury definition is something that happens to the brain from an external force. Uh, a blow to the head, uh, a blast injury, a bomb goes off, something externally that happens to the brain, which is very different from a stroke, which is something internally. In the, brain, in the older person, they bleed on the inside of the brain. And that's why the rehab that we have been doing doesn't work for this younger group, because it's a totally different injury and a totally different brain that we're dealing with. Post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress injury, which I call it either of those two, is actually, Lindsay, a survival mechanism, okay? What we have found out that usually the brain is set up with a previous traumatic brain injury, whether it be in childhood or, or sometime prior to this perfect particular event, that sets up a chemical rebound phenomenon within the brain so that it keeps playing back what was a very stressful event, whether it was an assault, whether it was a uh, motor vehicle accident, whether it was a bomb that went off and, and half of your troops that were with you perished in it. I mean, these are real life situations. But if you think about it, it's what your brain is doing to keep you alive again. And your brain is trying to tell you, okay, that's why it's not a disorder. It's actually a super survival mechanism. You know, what it's saying is, okay, you get these same set of circumstances again, you better act the exact same way because 
you're alive. And as I tell my young veterans who come back and they can't understand why they can't get rid of this, I said, you know, keep this in mind. Only survivors have post-traumatic stress. Only survivors. Nobody who perished has it. It is a survival mechanism. And if we look at it like that, instead of adding that word disorder, I mean, there's something wrong with you. You know, why, why can't you get over this? You know, we have five to 7% of the civilian population with post-traumatic stress injury every day. So I think that it's really good to bring this up and to say that we can all, we're all subject to both of these actually. So I think that people go through post-traumatic stress injury, not only from warfare, but from abusive marriages and near fatal accidents. And maybe God forbid they had a child that died, all of these things. What are the typical symptoms that might manifest and you know we know that people who experience post-traumatic stress as well as traumatic brain injury are more prone to depression and mental health um, needs we'll call them needs instead of disorders and are, are more likely to consider suicide but what do we look for that's more subtle, that doesn't get us to that point? What's the subtleness that we can look out for? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the similarities and some of the differences, because there's a, a lot in that question, for sure. Um, Post-traumatic stress injury is a chemical imbalance, okay? So it is chemicals in the brain that aren't operating like they should. The one thing, and there are actually several things, so I'm gonna talk about in unison, PTSI versus TBI, okay? Both of them have a severe depression. And the reason being is because they are both chemicals, all of our happy chemicals are endorphins that you know are really jazzed up when we move around. Well, if you're injured, if you've been in one of these situations where something violent has happened, you're not really moving. You're not, so you, your endorphins are taken out. Your stress levels are through the roof so that all of your like anti-stress hormones, they're taken out because they're already utilized. And all of the things that help you get motivated and help you feel good about yourself have all disappeared from the brain and at once. I mean, this happens over the course of just a couple days and it takes multiple weeks to build them back up. So that's so why it isn't. So is that is that just because when the blunt force trauma or as as a friend of mine who experienced PTSI, he underwent 11 minutes of active fire in Afghanistan. Is it just because your brain panics so much that it releases all of those chemicals at one time in a like you must survive right now? How does that how do they deplete so quickly? You know, that's very good. Yes, that does happen. But in a brain that isn't injured, either through the PTSI or or the TBI, it will build back up a lot more quickly. What it is, is it leaves the cells, but the cells are still working to rebuild it. What happens with the TBI or the traumatic brain injury, your cells aren't working. Your vascular flow to your brain isn't working like it is. So nothing is transmitting. Your, your neurons aren't firing because they're not getting the chemicals that they need. So it is kind of like I, I tell uh, my young vets that, you know, unlike any other organ in the body, the brain is your computer. And that's what, it, and it acts like a computer. It does not act like anything else. So whatever's working on your hard drive at the time you go, that's what goes down. And if your computer crashes, there may be those times when you can just kind of reset it and it comes back up and you feel really good. And then there's those other times that it doesn't. And you take it in someplace and they still can't and other times when you have to get a new computer. So it just depends on what is working at the time and how much kind of rebound you have in your brain by itself, okay. So both of those conditions are prone to depression. The person with a traumatic brain injury, however, because of the anatomic disruption of everything, rather than just a chemical disruption, they have anatomical and chemical, is much more prone to suicide, about eight times more prone to suicide than a person who has not sustained a traumatic brain injury. And then if you add some of the medications, some of the psychotropic medications that you would know about from your doctor of pharmacy that you have, you know too that that has a different effect depending on what age it is that you're taking these. You know, there are certain of those medications you won't even give a teenager because their brain is so plastic at that time. You know, you don't want to do that. So that's the big hallmark difference is that it really does lead to suicide. They both lead to isolation. 
They both lead to avoidance of things going on around them. Um, the person with the TBI, it's primarily because the main activity of your brain is to filter out the environment for you. And if your brain is injured, you can't filter. It's all coming at you. So as opposed to people with post-traumatic stress, a person with a brain injury will have trouble, what we call photophobia, fear of light, because you can't filter out the light. You know, your pupils aren't working like they should. So like I tell every healthcare provider, every family member, every parent who thinks that maybe their child in sports may have a TBI, if they're wearing their sunglasses inside or outside on a cloudy day because it's too bright for them, get them to see a healthcare professional because wow. that is a hallmark for traumatic brain injury. What also, a, what a injury. simple thing for parents right, to remember. Right. What a it simple, is. simple thing. And I would assume that if all of a sudden your child goes from loving life and excelling at school to being withdrawn, to Absolutely. personality changes, all of those things um, could also play into it. I must, I must imagine that substance abuse is also a major problem. Well, you know, and it is, and when you think about it, okay, and again, there's a whole lot of lingo in, in the medical profession that you and I as kind of healers also don't like, like we don't like disorder. We'll, we'll choose the injury because that's more restricted. But when you talk about substance abuse, is it really substance abuse? I don't think so. What I believe is going on and what happened in my own brain is you are trying everything possible to get your brain back to where it was. So when you have a brain injury, it does one or two things. It either goes very slow, like mine did. And I mean, it was like on slow-mo for weeks. I couldn't speak. I couldn't think. I couldn't see things correctly. So I became like caffeine addict. I mean, because caffeine would at least kind of speed up the brain. And chocolate, you know, those two things, I mean, it really did. If you are um, a person who may be out on the street, you get an amphetamine or you get multiple amphetamines, you know. You are trying to get your brain back to go. Now, if you are a person who has the traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress injury or PTSI, you're trying to stop that brain. That brain is just going overdrive, playing back the same horrific thing that happened to you, and you just want to silence it. So you try to silence it with alcohol, number one. Number two, right now in the younger population is marijuana. Number three are opiates. Many people who have these injuries were also injured at the same time and uh, had some other pain or chronic pain issues that are getting to them as well. So those are the things you try to do. About 40 to 70% of the young people who have a traumatic brain injury will have some substance that they abuse, whether it be a legal substance, nicotine, caffeine, whether it be an illegal substance or whether it be a prescription drug. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we see in, and this is kind of a little bit off topic, but we see exploitations of our people with mental health needs when you're actually, first, the tobacco industry wrote the playbook of just flooding psychiatric units with with nicotine and tobacco and and nicotine is such a powerfully addictive drug because it is simultaneously activating as well as relaxing and now we see it we saw it with the opioid crisis we see right. it with just that that desire to numb what is in us or right. To, as you said, get back to where I was. And right. so, and so you mentioned that you couldn't see straight, you couldn't think right. straight, you were just desperate to get your brain active the way that it once was. Talk to us more about your processing of memories because oh, wow. yeah that's a that's a big one and one of the things that I want to say just why you kind of cued me up in it um I want everybody in your listening audience to understand the degree of disability I had not because it's like poor me or well me because I was really stupid don't get me wrong but because when I went to the ER I had a normal MRI I had a normal CAT scan. And here was what happened with me. Because my colleagues knew me, because I was in my own hospital, they believed everything I said. The oh, what a blessing. I, right. But that is not the blessing that our veterans get at all when they come back from war. And that is why I kind of got the call. I, I said that I was drafted by the universe, by my traumatic brain injury, to take on this mission. Because when I heard about them coming back, and I said, oh, they're malingering. Oh, you know. No, they're not. You can have major issues going on with 
the basic tests that we have being very normal. You know, you have to go to the more specific tests. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, jump into that. Um, well, it's the same thing that I say about when people go in and they get vitamin and mineral levels tested and, and it says, oh, it's normal. Well, yeah, yeah, but it's subclinical, you know, it's subclinical. You don't fit into that bell curve that we deem as well, that's a normal MRI. That's a normal chest Absolutely. film. That's a normal CBC, whatever it is. <laughs> when you don't fit into that mold, it becomes a perplexing thing about like, well, you should be fine. And um, okay, so I have another follow-up question, but I do want to hear about how it impacted your memory, memory. as well. Yeah, so this is again, when we take it down to anatomy, when we take it down to basics, survival and anatomy, it makes sense that our new memory is farther out on the outside of the brain, okay? That makes sense. And our saved memory is deeper, it's protected. It's when laying down memory of how to live since you were born, okay? So what happens to most people with their traumatic brain injury is they still keep that long-term memory, but that short-term memory is gone. So you can't remember at 4 p.m. what you were to remember at 2 p.m. or at 7 a.m. You know, you're not laying down. It's going to take longer for that to come back. And that is what is so frustrating for you because you literally can't. That, what, that was so frustrating for me. And here's the other thing that I really want to tell all of you, and you have so many, and I'm so grateful for that. But what I tell my young veterans is, so the difference between where the, the long-term memory sits kind of in the middle of that brain and where your short-term memory sits out here is about two to three inches. So what I tell them is all we need to do is to lay down that pathway. You're mm -hmm. about two to three inches from normal or your new normal. That's all you are. But here is the deal. As you know from all of your medical training, we don't get better with a traumatic brain injury all of a sudden. I mean, like, Two days from now, I'm going to feel fine. It's nothing like it is on Hollywood, you know. Nothing, nothing gets better instantly. Nothing exactly. And I, to the, um, I've got to say to our football players out there, they are great actors because we don't know what's going on with them when they get off the field either. And I've talked to several NFL players who say they don't even remember the game, you know. But yet they were able to talk to the announcer, you know. About, I mean, it's just is really, really very interesting. So. Um, with that memory, keep working at it, working at it, working at it. What I say is you won't get better until all of a sudden, six months later, you'll remember everything. Said. But once it comes back, it doesn't usually leave again. And that was something new that I learned by keeping my own journal, you know. But it took me six weeks to speak, six weeks. And I was going over and trying to read and trying to listen. But when I did, I said a complete sentence. And it Aww. never completely went away. Now, it wasn't a really intelligible sentence. <laughs> my, my people around me weren't sure what I was saying, but, but at least it was five words in a row, <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's yeah. what I want them to say. Don't get discouraged because your brain will continue to evolve as long as you keep challenging it. It will continue to evolve for you, lay down new pathways and keep changing. So we are in the midst of an election year yes. and for for people who really have a soft spot in their heart for this issue and really want to make sure you know Americans are are nothing if not patriotic. We we love being American and we are universally grateful for the sacrifices that our veterans give. Unfortunately, the, the VA hospitals are not the best place to receive care for a lot of people. So what advice would you give our voters, our lawmakers, the medical community, our activists who say, wow, this woman has so inspired me. I'm going to look up her, her foundation, Resurrecting Lives. What can we do as civilians and and, and conscious citizens of the United States to help bring our veterans back to America in a way that allows them to move forward with their life with ease? Yeah, I, I really love that question. And I will say, the first thing that I'd like to say, and I actually am a person who really honors and respects our elected leaders. I mean, no matter what side of the aisle you on, all of these people gave up something to be there. Okay, that's how I feel. What I want to say that then please start getting along. Just please. Oh, no. We can hope for that. Let's just please, all collectively like, take a moment. Like, 
Exactly. And it just take takes listening. It takes listening, you right. know? Right, and, and up to our voters to make sure that they get that message. You know, that's what I think is very, very important. The other thing I will say is this. We were very lucky, and it's kind of gotten lost in all this election, like you're talking about, that last year um, on Capitol Hill, they actually did pass a very important piece of legislation, the Choice Act which allowed veterans to go and seek help outside of the Veterans Administration. Now, it's so important for TBI because only eight to 10% of all healthcare workers in the, in the nation even deal with TBI. And let me tell you, they're not concentrated in the Veterans Administration Hospital. We also have about 47 to 51% of our veterans from these wars and even the Vietnam War who live in rural areas. So they're not near the mega VA centers that are excellent. You know, they're not near Stafford. Who can afford to live in Palo Alto? You know, they're in Palo Alto and Tampa and Boston and Minneapolis, but they're not in the rural communities where are. So if we can make sure that our lawmakers have that law go through. It's signed into law, but it's kind of gotten lost in all of the, you know, pandemic and everything else going on. Exactly. So, you know, it is a very important one to get out there. I will also say to communities to remember that, you know, I've now interviewed, let's see, maybe 700, 750 veterans from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And of those 600 plus decided to serve our nation because they were in middle school or high school, when the towers came down. And they made that decision that day. I had the, the lowest was one guy who was in third grade at the time. They went from their family's home to the military boot camp, which is amazing in itself in terms of the endurance and the amount of injuries that happened there, you know, both broken bones and broken brains. I mean, and then to go in combat in a world that is four to five centuries earlier than we are now. Okay. Lots of horrible things going on that they've not seen in their hometown in their rural USA. And then they're coming back here and being discharged over a week. You know, here you are, here's a handful of cash and a handful. They've never been acclimated to living in a community. So if you know that they're there, please help them. Please help their family. They are used to being in a sisterhood and brotherhood that would die for each other. And suddenly they come to our communities and the smaller the community, the more caring there seems to be. Everybody knows each other. The larger the community gets a little hard, but, but welcome them into your church, into your school, into employment. If there is employment there, keep in mind that it may take a little more time for this veteran to lay down new information about what they're doing, but spend that time because they're used to working together. They're used to being part of a team. They're used to taking orders and they are used to completing a mission. They are worth the extra time and the extra investment. Dr. Chris Ann Gordon, it is such an eye-opening experience to talk with you and to see your passion for what you give to your veterans. As you said, the universe chose you for this, and I think that that is absolutely true. Before I let you go, could I ask you a couple of lightning round questions? Sure. Who has been the greatest influence in your life? My grandfather, without a doubt. Yes, yes, my Irish grandfather, I will tell you. And uh, I will tell you how important it was because this is really kind of cool. You know, I was volunteering at the VA to do this traumatic brain injury. Now, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Volunteering, they don't have somebody doing that. Do you know what I mean? So uh, after about a year of doing it a few times a month, I was called into the office. They said, well, you know, we think we're going to have to let you go because you're diagnosing too many people with TBI. Okay, I'm only diagnosing the ones that have it. And did you realize today is St. Patrick's Day? (laughs) I said, said, you just called me on the carpet for doing the right thing on St. Patrick. And I could literally feel my grandfather, who was a World War I veteran, saying, okay, you can't let this go. (laughs) So yeah, he's definitely my biggest influence. And and lightning round, I'll try to keep it shorter. Sorry. Uh, No, it's fine. I asked asked a follow-up question. You answered in one word. You did perfectly. Okay. What makes you laugh? Um, I think the world does. And I will tell you, my veterans make me laugh. Uh, As dark as their lives are, believe it or not, and Lindsay, when you talk to them, you'll find the same thing. They're worried about you. They're worried about what you're going to say or how you're going to react to this horrible situation they're giving. And they will say something that makes you laugh. You know, I think that the world, we take ourselves too seriously, the world too seriously. Everybody should love Seinfeld because 
those episodes happen in all of our lives. <laughs> Every single day. It's Every like, oh, day. oh man, I'll never forget going by the, the soup, the soup Nazi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it used to be right by my yoga studio and people thought I was insane. Cause here I am this like well-dressed yoga clad white chick. Who's just sitting on the curb in New York, <laughs> eating my soup Nazi soup. And I loved it, which uh, by the way, they are totally kind people. You should go check them out on uh, okay. 8th Avenue and I think 50th street in New York. Okay. okay. What is your favorite place in the entire world? Oh, that's very easy. Um, there is a very high mountain pass by the Maroon Bells in Aspen, Colorado. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm a big Aspenite because that is not the case. I began hiking in Aspen in the summertime before all of the Californians found out about it. <laughs> I mean, this has been going on now. Uh, I, I was in love with John Denver. She was born <laughs> in the summer of her 27th year. When I was 27, I did my first trek and I've been back there every year since. And it's where I go to, there's just, it's quiet. There's nobody there. And I just listen like, okay, what is it I'm supposed to do next year? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's Aspen, Colorado. Oh, absolutely. I love that. Last but not least, God to you is? Uh, my best friend. Um, I will tell you, it's really true. And I think that I am God's comic relief. You know, uh, when you think about, I mean, I have never served. My my grandfather served in World War One. My father served in World War Two. But he was in intelligence. Didn't you know? See combat. I'm this Midwestern solo practitioner, middle aged white chick saying, oh, sure, I'll tell the DOD how to do this. Like, I would have never chosen me. You know, this was the wrong person for the while. And yet I said, okay, well, it's kind of happened, so we'll have to go with it. So I'd have to say that uh, God for me is my best friend who challenges me every day, but always has my back. And isn't that just a beautiful thing to be perfectly imperfect in every oh, single oh, way, every all single of the time, way. all of the time. Oh, Dr. Chris Ann Gordon, it has been such an honor to talk to you. Please go and check out and donate to the Resurrecting Lives Foundation. You can find them at www.resurrectinglives.org. May we all take a moment of gratitude to thank our veterans and understand that the love and the care that our veterans deserve does not end when they return from the battlefield. Thank you so much for Thank being so on the Lindsay you. Elmore show. Thank you for everything that you do to make this nation more united, kinder, gentler, and definitely more hopeful and more healthy. Thank you so much. Feeling vibrant, healthy, and fit should be really simple. Unfortunately, I find that most women out there are just kind of running on neutral. Most people find that sometimes throughout their day, they want to feel better, but too many health and wellness programs out there require way too much money, are too advanced in the kitchen, require tons of gear or equipment, and they don't provide any kind of system for support or my least favorite are just all based on shakes and supplements that leave you feeling hungry. That's why I created the Clean Slate Cleanse. I wanted people to feel empowered to cook healthier meals because they had easy to follow recipes and easy to find ingredients. I wanted everybody to know that they had the power and the ability to take back control when their health seems to be slipping away. You can also just find a renewed sense of confidence and life when you dive into changing the way that you eat. It's about more than just what's on your plate. It's about finding daily inspiring activities that allow you to connect the mind and the body. When you join the Clean Slate Cleanse, you get a transformational 21-day program that changes the way that you cook, that you eat, and that you relate to the food on your plate. No fasts, no gimmicks, no starvation, no endless shakes and supplements, just real plant-based foods that reveal the health and wellness that is already inside of you. 
All you have to do to join our next Clean Slate Cleanse, look around at the recipes and purchase the cookbook and the workbook as well as read testimonials from people just like you is head to www.cleanslatecleanse.com. That's www.cleanslatecleanse.com. In this next segment, you are going to hear from Jason Sapp. Just a warning, it gets to be very, very real and covers topics like violence, trauma, infidelity, drug use, and suicide. So if you have children or anyone who's not prepared to hear a story like that, now is a good time to fast forward. Hello friends, my name is Jason Sapp. I am a Jesus follower and Iraq war combat veteran. I'm an entrepreneur, an author, a life coach, husband, and father of two. As a service-connected disabled combat veteran, I understand the effects of PTSD on an individual, but I've also seen it in how it affects those that love that person, my family. And I wanna share that story with you today. I'm gonna to share with each of you today, openly and freely, a letter to my bride, to my wife, Stephanie Lynette. Lynette, I will attempt to express my deepest love and gratitude for you, but I know my words will come short. Maybe the words just aren't in the English language for me to speak. Maybe I just can't find the words that my heart and emotions experience. We have been together for over 17 years, and in many ways, we have been to hell and back, with the best part being the fact that our past is just that, in our past. We can look back with clear vision on what we've been through, which allows deeper reflection and gratitude for where we are today. I hope to reflect back on some of the key events in our past that God was able to turn from a negative and painful experience to healing and reconciliation with hope, peace, and love. We met on a blind date and essentially fell in love at first sight on January 16, 2003. I had just finished my Army basic training and job training, and as a reservist, I was able to come home to Texas and move to Huntsville to attend college. Little did you or I know that President Bush was already ramping up military deployments to Kuwait for the pending invasion of Iraq that took place on March 19th and 20th of 2003. During that time, we had so much fun together. We were lighthearted and enjoyed every minute of our marriage. We had huge hope for the future, and as it turned out, we started our family early on in our marriage. We married a month after we met on February 16, 2003. I was immobilized with my reserve unit on March 7th, and I served a service support mission in Kuwait, which let me have some access to the internet and to, to phones. We got to know each other so well through our letters, emails, and calls. My desire to serve our country hadn't let up after that tour. So I went active duty and got stationed in Germany. It was a trying time for our marriage. We both grew in different ways as I prepared for my next tour that ended up in Baghdad later that year. We had the honor and joy to bring our two daughters into this world, and our family was complete. Despite our trying times, we enjoyed our time together. We had a motto of dessert first, which meant to enjoy the goodness and sweetness of life as a priority. We did the best with what we had. My second tour was a unique combat mission that led my unit into the heart of central Baghdad as we spearheaded the surge. Although I did my job every day, I could not unsee and unsmell what I went through. I could not turn off the screams in the blood, bodies, and body parts. I never wavered in a firefight, but my dreams were torturing me, even there in Baghdad. I came home with a quick medical discharge, an honorable discharge from the army. Although I was home, the battle on the home front had just begun. What you were enduring within our marriage was differences of faith and with my PTSD, and it left our marriage empty. I recall telling you one day that I knew you and our girls loved me, but I couldn't feel love or return it. I just couldn't feel anything. I didn't fear, nor was I happy. At one point, I felt so numb, and it didn't just go away. It didn't go away at all. It cost us our marriage with our daughters only three and four years old. They were too young to know what was happening. Our divorce was finalized a year after my discharge. I remember that you told me you forgave me after the affair that cost our marriage. I couldn't accept it, and I told you so. We kept in great communication despite my pain and struggles, but it all came to a head on October 4, 2008, when I attempted suicide. 
I am grateful that I wasn't successful, even though the moments after I woke up in the hospital, it didn't seem like it. But you came back to me and was the only one to stay by my side. My family came and went, but you stayed. We started over and got remarried on December 6, 2008. Although life was still a struggle for years, you were still there. You kept things going when I couldn't, and even vice versa. What I didn't know was how much trauma you endured in our marriage and due to my hardships with my combat PTSD. In reality, you developed secondhand PTSD and struggled with your own triggers and anxiety. From the affairs, from the hardship of PTSD that I struggled with, we not only survived that period of our marriage, but we grew so much individually and in our marriage. I had caused so much pain, especially when I was living with so much pain within. At times, we both hurt each other, but we were both operating from a place of pain, not love. We grew through those seasons, and now here we are, 17 years later. Our daughters are 15 and 16, and we have so much to live for and so much to see and do in our lives going forward. Our healing journey has been complex and came in waves, both individually and within our marriage. But when I look back, I have no regrets. We are who we are because of what we went through. It has made us stronger, smarter, wiser, calmer. We love harder, work harder, and play even harder because of what we've been through. I have no regrets about our story, our marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Living without regrets is one major way of living in freedom. The past doesn't hold you hostage in that mindset. It can't touch you. So by leaning into this mindset, I can see the positives more than the negatives. I feel the gratitude that I do today, a gratitude that I have for God and for you. You reached into the depths of my darkest days and stayed by my side while I struggled with my war when nobody else would. You were my soldier, my battle buddy, that gave more than what was deserved or earned. You are my hero and my angel. So today, I honor you for your sacrifice through all those years. For your service as an army wife and mom. For coming back to me in my darkest hours. For your enduring love and dedication. For your passion to life school our girls from the beginning through their graduation. For your dedication to serving others through so many different ways. Stephanie Lynette, I love and honor you for being you, the authentic woman that God has blessed throughout your life. I love how God has shown his grace and mercy on both of us. So let me tell the world your story, the one that shaped you into the woman you are today. It began unexpectedly as your parents went to the regular monthly checkup with the doctor. That's when everything changed. Your mom had preeclampsia and had a stroke that left her paralyzed on half her body. You were born two and a half months premature at just over three pounds. It was a scary time for your dad and extended family, but God's grace prevailed and you grew strong and your mom fully recovered, regaining all mobility and speech. Your family was blessed with your sister that came three years after your birth. Through thick and thin, you were filled with joy and happiness. You loved hard and others loved you too. You became a twirler just like your mom was when she was in high school. You were friends to everyone and you were liked by everyone. You were popular and was voted Miss LHS. You had a dream early on to be a wife and a mom, just like your mom. But you were hurt by boys that couldn't love you like you deserved with terrible breakups that ended suddenly. But it wasn't your fault. They were boys and were not meant to be yours anyways. After high school, you went to college and became an amazing real estate agent. You loved being around others and enjoyed your work. That is the season where we met through your best friends who set us up on a blind date. We fell in love so fast. Our love story is so deep and so profound, and I'm so thankful for you, for that history, and for our sweet family. I am grateful for the life we get to live now, and for the love we have, and for the joy and confidence we have going forward. I am so thankful for your courage, for your compassion, for your willingness to sacrifice for us, for our family so greatly over the years. I'm so grateful that we got the opportunity to even find each other in this crazy big world of ours. I'm so thankful for our girls and for the joy they've brought into our home and for the joy that they will have moving forward in their life as they go into adulthood. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful that I had PTSD. I'm thankful for the journey that we went on because it has made us stronger. It has made us who we are today. 
And I'm grateful that we have been able to find the healing, the restoration, the reconciliation that so many lose sight of and never get to achieve. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Our story is so unique. So many don't get the opportunity for that reconciliation and for healing. We are blessed and blessed greatly. And I express that love and gratitude for all that we've been through and the cost that we have paid to be where we are today. Stephanie Lynette, I love you. And I'm so thankful for the life we have been blessed to live. Your soulmate, your man, Jason. The Lindsay Elmore Show is written and produced by me, Lindsay Elmore. Show segments are produced by Sue Procco and Kelsey Lorman. Production design, sound design, and editing is by Jive Media. If you have a question about this or any other episode of the podcast, send us an email to hello at lindsayelmoreshow.com. And hey, since you're still here, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And while you're at it, go over and follow us on Instagram at Lindsay Elmore Show. This helps us bring the pod to more people.